Okay, we're going to get started again. Hope everybody had some time to mingle around and talk to one another and had time to maybe get on and do your voting. Um, we're going to turn the rest of our time this morning over to Sam Comfort. He's a beekeeper and bee breeder out of Florida. But I'm going to let him kind of give his own introduction so he can brag about himself. Last night, I did have a chance to sit down with Sam and chit chat for about, I don't know, two, three hours after the dinner. We had a, a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. There's a lot of knowledge that Sam's got to, to share with us today. Sam. Okay. Thank you, Jared. Oh, how's everyone doing? How's morale? <laughs> it's great to be here. It's great to be here in person. Hello to everyone in Zoom land and stuff. Hope to meet you face to face one day. Um, well, where do I begin? Well, I'm Sam Comfort. I'm not on the ski slopes. I've actually uh, came straight from Florida where it's 85 degrees. <laughs> and uh, I have over 200 queens in the bank right now. I really couldn't spare the time to come, but I've never been to Utah before and uh, just really wanted to come out here. And it's just, it's such a beautiful city. So I'm, I'm really grateful for you all having me out here. Definitely going to spend an extra couple of days trying to hit some ski slopes or some hot springs or something. So hit me up after class and we can go uh, hang out in town. <laughs> well, well, where do we get started? Uh, what is this picture all about? I don't even know if this is the right talk. I don't have any idea what this has to do with anything, but what this even is, really. But, well, believe it or not, this little pen and ink drawing of this mouse on this little tube structure is what made me want to be a beekeeper. Uh, well, you know, I tell people that I won six hives in a poker game, and that's how I got my start in bees, but that's not actually true. It's uh, just the best story that I've come up with, <laughs> and it's, it's worked for me so far. But really, I was, uh, you know, going to school in upstate New York, and uh, I was uh, doing a lot of art stuff, playing with sticks and mud, real interested in materials, got real interested in where food was coming from, and just the way people live, and the way people like, survive. And I got into the permaculture books. Permaculture is this idea of permanent agriculture, sustainable agriculture, of uh, working with natural systems rather than trying to control them you know, in uh, monocrop farming. Saw a lot of uh, potential of how people grow food and source food. And I found uh, the Permaculture Designer's Manual, a really big book uh, written by Bill Mollison in Australia. This was before permaculture became a very uh, trendy, hip thing that's become a global movement. Uh, this book hadn't been checked out since the 80s and had all these funny pen and ink drawings through this big text and I'm leafing through, leafing through, and I came across this, this one drawing. I'm like, what is this thing? And I, I read what this was about, and it turns out, you know, I'm in the bush of Australia. People were building these PVC pipe structures, putting them out in fields, and field mice were running into these structures and storing their wild grains and wild rices. And the humans would come and harvest from the field mice. And they said, as long as they left about 20% of the grains there, the mice just kept packing more <laughs> of their forage in there. And this blew my mind. This really like, shattered the, the screen I was using to, to view the world. Like, whoa, suddenly uh, pests, like mice and rodents were suddenly your allies. And it's just like made me think like, wow, there's a, such a different perspective we could take. And like, the way that the world was already working around us and like you know mice have been around as long as we have and doing their things like well maybe we could work together and so this may be really like a you know, rethink some of the relationships we have with the, the natural world around us and maybe want to be a some sort of farmer like that i was interested in maybe raising bison or herding sheep or something but i really uh but what it came down to is i met some friends who knew beekeepers up in vermont who ran a thousand hives they said I could park my van out back of the honey house and just go to work for a living getting stung. And that's exactly what I did. So is my clicker going to work here? Is it on? Oh, let me try. 
I don't know if it kind of worked. You want to try to advance me next slide? Yeah. <laughs> well, going to work, getting stung is exactly what I did. And I learned about all the problems in this industry. So this was like every once in a while, it does actually rain in California. And sometimes this is what happens. This uh, They couldn't even get the, the forklift off the truck to, to move these bees and this mud slide. Oh, sorry. Go back. Uh, this was in Texas when it finally started to rain. So even when your bees are, are happy and healthy and stuff, because there's no real normal in our weather anymore, uh, this was like a, a normal yard, one of those hundred year floods that, that wiped out this aviary in Texas. And you can even see that the bees are trying to bubble out these boxes here and trying to survive, but it was a total loss. And it's like, it, no matter how good a beekeeper you are, the world's just changing. And so we're all just on our toes. So, you know, what's happening in this relationship? We got bees and people, people and bees. So despite the problems that we see in our bees, it's really, I think the honeybees are gonna be just fine. They've been around for you know, 60 million years, 70 million years. I really think they have the ability to solve problems. We're not saving the bees. It's kind of presumptuous to think that us humans are gonna be the ones to save the bees. If anything, it's gonna be the other way around. You know, that colony collapse disorder, it's more like CCD, it's more like PCD, people collapse disorder. Yep. So, you know, you think of the way that bees work, the way that they, they just eat, the way that they feed themselves, it's totally symbiotic with the plants that they visit. Spreading pollen from plant to plant means that bees uh, have become the catalyst for diversity. They've created the biodiversity all the way around the world. Other, otherwise, everything would just be grass and pine trees. So bees working this over tens of millions of years have created a, all these different plant species by furthering their evolution just by the way that they feed themselves. It's a, just a total symbiotic uh, creating diversity and, and uh, making, making a more res uh, resilient world. All these differences and nuances and adaptations. Whereas humans, we're doing the exact opposite. We go to a landscape, we sterilize it and put in row farms or even worse parking lots and, and things. And it almost looks suicidal the way that we're just monoculturing everything. We have a lot to learn from the way that the honeybees are living as opposed to the way that we're doing things and approaching our landscape. So that's one of the things that the bees can really teach us, you know? So, you know, I got my start in bees. I was 21 years old. I didn't know a thing about it. My first day on the job, I walked into that bee yard, and even before I got my veil on, I, I guess I just wasn't walking right, or maybe I didn't smell right or something. Uh, I didn't have those zen fluid movements it takes to work a beehive. But even before I opened a beehive, the bees just came at me. They, uh, I, they started getting stuck in my hair and stinging my, my neck and my face, and I freaked out. I had no idea what to expect already, but it, uh, it was a... Uh, it was the worst <laughs> that I could have imagined. So I ran. I ran out of that bee yard. I ran a couple hundred feet away. The bees start, stopped chasing me after a little bit. And I, I sat down. I started to catch my breath. I started picking the stingers out of my neck. And I looked at this beautiful blue sky and this green field on this Vermont spring day. And I waited to see if I was going to die. <laughs> and I, I didn't die. And somehow I finished out the work of that day. For some reason, I came back to work the next day. And at that point, I was totally hooked on beekeeping. I realized it was the hardest thing that I had ever done in my life. And for that reason, I wanted to stick with it. And that was 19 years ago. And I've been messing with bees just about every single day since. I don't think it's gotten any easier, but uh, it's that challenge that really was like the driving force of uh, just trying to, to get outside, it just like, really just was a really tough, I've uh, never worked that hard in my life. So it created a huge appreciation to all farm life of uh, anyone who's growing food. And it's really, unless you're in it, you don't realize the amount of work that goes into, you know, just feeding ourselves. Um, well, you know, I was in Vermont for uh, you know, a, a, a couple months, you know, it seemed that all my friends were moving to Brooklyn. I decided on a whim to move to Montana. And I had some friends going out there. And uh, my first day out there, I looked in the phone book and found a beekeeper. I said, yeah, show up the, the, the next day. And so I've been working for this thousand hive operation in Vermont. We stayed at home. We, we sold raw honey and some plant medicine products. And I moved out to Montana and signed up for a 5,000 hive operation. 
you know, four hives on a pallet. We put 400 hives in a semi truck. We shipped them from Montana down to the San Joaquin Valley of California. We lived in hotels through the winter and pollinated the almonds in February for a couple of weeks. And then after that, we scooped them up and pollinated some apples up in Washington State. And then after that, we went back to Montana. We pollinated all the cherry orchards around Flathead Lake. And we did some melons and things after that uh, that made a, a bit of honey, uh, especially when it rained <laughs> in Montana. But mostly we were just revamping these bees to this pollination circuit. Again, you know, these guys used to be able to stay at home and uh, make a living selling honey and support a family that way. But now it's, uh, they would go down maybe to California to build their bees up early uh, you know, their pollination contracts would maybe pay their gas and they, they make their living doing honey. Now it's the opposite, you know, the honey that pays for the infrastructure, they make their living zipping them down to California. And these are the most innovative, hardworking people that I, I had ever seen, you know. Uh, if you miss a time to feed or miss a time to medicate, especially for varroa mites, the next time you go to your bee yard, you might not have any bees left. And they're the first ones to admit that they've created a monster, that they can't stop treating, they can't stop feeding because they had growers that were supporting them. It's really the hard work of these beekeepers is enabling our food production all across America. You know, the US is already a net food importer. We're not even feeding ourselves. So the food that we do produce here in this country is supported by these migratory pollinators and the hard work that they do. But, you know, they, they, uh, they say that they've like, created a monster. They can't get off this chemical wagon. They've got growers to support. They've got family to support and their payroll to meet. And it's just a, a, a world that uh, has uh, just changed so much from, you know, the way that their parents did it or the way that beekeeping was ever run before. But these guys are always up on like what to do to keep their bees alive, what treatments are working, what treatments are failing and uh, things like that. And they just, uh, I, I have so much respect for these guys. And I did uh, migratory pollination for about five years and I learned the ropes. I did every kind of chemical imaginable, put in antibiotics, put into beehives. And I'm just grateful for that experience of uh, learning what people have to do in order to keep their bees alive in this system of farming that is really just rough on them. You know, these, these bees were going from monoculture to monoculture. Like there's only one thing growing in, in California almond groves, there's just miles of sand and nutrient solution and the sticks in the ground, just the almond trees. So these will make almond honey, they'll do very well during the almond bloom, but as soon as that bloom is over, they have to be carted out so they don't start to starve. And uh, they're only getting one kind of pollen. So monocultures take a, a lot of pesticides, you know, because it's just one thing, it's like a banquet for certain pests, pesticides, fungicides, Plus the bees are only getting this one mono nutrition, just one kind of pollen from farm to farm. So they need all kinds of supplemental feeding to try to expand their, their nutrients. And so they're going from farm to farm that is poisoning and malnourishing them. You add the stress of being on the road, it's really no secret why bees are dying these days. It's just a really tough life, but this is the, the system of farming that uh, our, our pollinators are put into. And how much longer can it go? We don't know. It's uh, it's really dependent on us beekeepers who are doing this pollination work. So, if you guys who uh, go to California, you have a lot of respect for me because I know the work that it takes and how hard it is on the bees to make ends meet. But you know, I uh, was like, so, so interested in, in how, like, based on bio, uh, bee biology, these guys organize their businesses. But I knew I could like, do different things. I was interested in where the queens came from and things like that, but I still was just like 22 years old, didn't know how I might fit in. I wasn't there to judge anybody's practices or something. I was just like interested in like, alternative methods and you know, like, kind of a kinder beekeeping or something that I could you know, just go out there with my shorts and sandals and mess around bees every day. But, so I was out there doing migratory pollination for almost two years when I got a call from my first boss in Vermont. He told me that his bees were crashing. He was down to 500 hives from the normal thousand that he ran. They crashed in the fall in Vermont. And so what he did is pick them all up, what he had left, picked them up by hand. He didn't have a forklift. He put them on a semi truck. He made some calls and some buddies gave him some locations down in South Carolina in the Tupelo swamps in Eastern South Carolina to hopefully give them a milder winter and earlier spring buildup so he could save his bees and save his bee business. He was tied up on the marketing end of things. He couldn't go down to work these bees. He couldn't find anyone to do it. So he called me up and 
pretty much begged me to come back and just do anything I could. And me being completely naive, I said, sure, I'll do what I can. And he stressed the fact that I was going to be all alone. I'm like, OK, <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Well, he dropped me off. It was the spring of 2005. He wished me luck. He threw me a map of where the bees were. And then he took up, headed back north. And I started going through the hives he had brought down. And I had to call him right away and tell him another half of the bees had died. He barely had 200 hives left from the normal thousand that he ran. And the bees looked terrible. The ground was literally crawling with shriveled wing bees. They were everywhere. They had deformed wing virus. The brood looked terrible. He had a white strip in every single hive box. That white strip was checkmite. It's a Kumafos product. Checkmite was used uh, oh, decades ago now as a mite treatment. It's an organophosphate. It's a neurotoxin. It's really nasty stuff. I pulled up one of these checkmite strips, and there were varroa mites crawling up and down on the strip that was meant to kill them. Uh, the, the treatment has had lost its efficacy. The mice had developed resistance. Uh, Checkmine replaced apistan. Apistan was the first chemical treatment in this country. It worked for a couple of years and stopped working, was replaced by checkmite. And here I was literally witnessing the failure of this chemical treatment. And I realized there just must be a better way. I was looking around. I was 24 years old at this point. I was responsible for millions of little lives. And I really had no idea what I was doing. The bees were crashing, like literally before my eyes. Like, I explained all this to the boss, not knowing what to do. The next day, 12 liters of formic acid showed up on my doorstep <laughs> that he rushed delivered down there. These days, formic acid is a uh, formulated into a, a gel product, a gel pad, by the way. It's a lot safer to handle. This is before that product was developed. This is before formic was a legal treatment. Uh, this was raw formic acid. <laughs> And I had to figure out how to mix it down to the right percentage solution. I got some butcher pads, dipped them in the acid, and I just held my breath as I laid it on the top bars of these uh, what beehives I had left in a desperate act. This was last resort. I'll talk a little bit about the IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Your first lines of defense being uh, like genetics, being uh, mechanical controls, brood breaks, things like that. But when those things failed, or when you're at this like, desperate point, you then bring out heavy artillery, like a, this formic acid as a last resort. And so I put some sticky paper underneath some of these hives. I came back the next day after the formic treatment and I pulled out the paper and there were literally rows of varroa mites on the paper that had fallen from in between the combs. That mite drop was in the thousands in each hive. And I thought like, wow, I'm saving the bees. This stuff really worked. And I started going through the hives. I realized like a bunch of young bees had been kicked out of the hive. A bunch of the, uh, the open brood had been burnt and, and, and taken out. And I lost a bunch of the queens. A good quarter of the queens had been burned by that formic. And even though it's a registered product uh, today, it's safer to handle, at the right dosage, at the right temperature, formic is very tough on the bees. It's tough on the mites. It's considered an organic treatment, but it's a, again, it's just a last resort thing. And in this uh, situation, we would have lost most of the bees if I hadn't done something to intervene at that point. So uh, even though it was very tough on the bees, that the bees stabilized, at least they weren't crashing and the bees chewed up by mites at, at every moment and things seemed to be at least a, a holding steady for a second there. We didn't have any queen bees ordered to split up these hives, typical in commercial beekeeping, you order uh, uh, Bunches of queens, hundreds if you, if you need them. They're mated, they're ready to go. You give them some roots of bees, uh, they're released from their cages, and, and they you know, instantly have a growing split like that. And well, in the springtime, it's almost impossible to find any available queens. They're already all bought up. And my boss said I could just make uh, splits with eggs. I could make what's called a walkaway split. I could take a strong hive, split it in half, and whatever side was queenless would build a queen. Uh, in her absence, as if they had swarmed, you know, and swarming, you know, the old queen leaves would have the bees into a new position, and they build several queens in her absence, and the best one, you know, fights it out and wins, hopefully. Uh, well, we didn't have any bees that were really strong enough to do that to. They've been knocked back by the varroa mites, and then by the varroa mite treatment that we didn't have anything that was almost like that splittable at a swarming level. 
And I wanted to get the operation uh, going and back up as close as I could back up to a thousand highs. So what I did is I did some reading. I hooked up with a couple of local beekeepers there and I taught myself how to graft. Grafting is the process of taking a little tiny tool, picking up a larva with this tool. You can't pick up an egg, eggs are too fragile. You can pick up a, a larva as small as possible, transfer it into a queen cup and put several of these cups into a very strong queenless hive. So if you make that walk away split, it's very simple. Just cut a strong hive in half and build a new queen in her absence. But you can take those same resources, that same strong hive. I'll go in there, I'll remove the queen. I'll remove all the eggs and larva out of that hive so they have no ability to raise their own queen. I'll leave them in that state for a couple hours. It's a stressful state for them. You know, this is like stressful, manipulative, invasive beekeeping, doing it, uh, this process. But Instead of raising one queen, as if I a walkway split, I'm letting them raise their own, I can go into that cell raiser, we call it, and graft in 40 or 50 of these queen cups and raise 50 new queen cells with that same amount of resources. So 10 days after I do that grafting process, I'll go in and I'll get those ripe queen cells that are about to emerge in another day or two. I'll then go out and make 50 splits. Each one gets a queen cell. I start 50 new hives. I can cook up 50 new beekeepers or things like that, as opposed to just getting one new queen. So it's all about the numbers and the speed, speeding up the process of the, this grafting. So that stress that causes on the bees is a means to an end just to make more bees very quickly and also control the genetics. So I started picking some of these hives that had better brood patterns that, weren't, that hadn't succumbed to this varroa mite infestation uh, as I started doing my first grafting. But actually, the first graphic did not go so well. I didn't have the, uh, the handy dandy Chinese push button bamboo grafting tool. It costs all of $2.99 at any bee supply place these days. It's, uh, it's what I use today. It's got a flexible tongue. It's very easy to slide under the larva, scoop up all the royal jelly with the larva when you transfer it. Uh, what I did have was a paper clip. And so I flattened down the end of this paper clip with a hammer into like a little tiny spoon. And it just didn't go very well at all. I was doing everything wrong. I didn't know. I was alone, you know. I was rolling the larva out of the cells. That was just mashing them up. I was using sunlight to light the larva, and the UV was just frying them. It, it did not go well at all. I did several grass with no takes, and I was, uh, I was looking bleak. But what helped out, the only way that I really pulled it off is that suddenly the Tupelo trees bloomed. It's that famous Tupelo honey. And this honey flow was so intense. Uh, so forgiven for me trying all these new methods and, uh, that my graphs started working. They started raising queen cells. I made splits. I put the right cells in, in the splits and then the splits started growing. I started having to split the splits. Uh, it was just a, such a good, good honey flow. I, I ran out of equipment pretty quickly. I started having to build frames and put in foundation all night long and build new boxes, just use them up the next day. As I go, this is no sleep. This was a full immersion, deep cover beekeeping. Uh, and, and just days went by without eating, without sleeping, just pouring bees, all bees, just eating honey. That, that's all I did, and grafting and splitting. That's what I did. And I looked around, I suddenly looked at the calendar, I realized it was the start of May. I've been doing this for two months. I counted the, the bees I had in each of these yards, and I realized the operation was back up to a thousand hives. So I, I was amazed at this work I, I had done. It's like a, on the other end, it's like, wow, this is the power of grafting. It's all about the numbers. Quickly, I was able to go from 200 hives back up to 1,000 in less than two months. And so I made some, uh, uh, well, they sent uh, some buddies down from, from Vermont to scoop up these bees with me. And so we brought these 1,000 hives back up, set them up in northern Vermont and upstate New York, right on the dandelion flow. And 2005 was just a bumper honey year. Some of those early queens that I raised went on to lead hives that made over 300 pounds of honey. Each. It was just an awesome year, and it was just uh, so cool. It made me a believer of like, like power of like recovery, of uh, rapid recovery, this idea of grafting, uh, raising lots of queens. And the boss told me that I was doing, I had done such a good job at this rescue mission. And since I was really making less than minimum wage anyway, <laughs> he said, take 10 hives. Take 10, any 10 hives in the whole operation. These would be your bees as a bonus. And, and find yourself a bee yard. These were the first bees that I ever uh, uh, had that I could call my own. I found myself a bee yard, took those 10 hives, I split them to 18 that summer, and I put them into a Vermont winter. 
which is you know, 30, 40 below zero <laughs> up there. I crossed my fingers, wrapped them up, see what I could do. But I knew I didn't want to uh, go that chemical route because I'd seen, already seen the chemicals fail and what that can do. It just seemed like a dead end road for me because now I had learned how to rapidly propagate bees, a rapid recovery. And I figured I'd be doing this for a while until like, I, I developed some stock that was resistant to grow mites. Not only grow, but like, uh, really was able to winter well and just like, a, you know, uh, steer these bees genetics towards what I was interested in as a beekeeper. And from my permaculture roots, that interest is minimal inputs and mass outputs, inputs, outputs like that. That's so what permaculture looking at the cycles and trying to, you know, strengthen the bees' natural defenses rather than trying to put a bandaid on the problem, whereas the bees get weaker and the pests just get stronger. So just trying to help the bees rather than trying to uh, uh, make ends meet. But I knew I like, uh, wasn't interested in honey or things like that. I know the queens were, were uh, way more valuable like that. Well, these are some of the first queen cells that I raised myself down in South Carolina when I was 24. And uh, it was pretty wild uh, <laughs> after that. I, well, I still didn't have any money to start like my own little bee operation. So I decided to go back out west and do pollination for another season. Uh, I made an arrangement with my bosses out there in Montana and Idaho. I would lease my own 200 hives, be under their wing, use their extractors, use their trucks, and, uh, and use uh, the pollination contracts as well. So after a year of, again, working at minimum wage, but I had my own bees to play with. And, you know, once I could clock out of work, I could go do my grafting and things like that. So I upped the numbers. I started grafting 2,000 of those queen cups a week. This is the second year of raising queens. I started selling queen cells to other beekeepers from the, the Northwest. We'd come and pick them up when they were ready to emerge. And it was just so cool to be able to grow bees so quickly with these new methods I had learned. And, but the real idea was to you know, get a pollination check the next spring. And once I got that check, I, I gave up the, the 200 hives I was leasing, it was my boss luck. And I, I kept five of my breeders that I had obtained from South Carolina to Vermont to Montana. And I made some money, just buy me some time. And I thought about like, what I was going to do next. Well, that winter, I went down to Florida, got a little bit more experience working for a beekeeper with 15,000 hives. I got introduced to small hive beetles, uh, four different species of ants that will annihilate a beehive, but also the potential of constant honey and nectar coming into uh, the constant uh, nectar and pollen coming into the hives. And uh, what, what beekeepers can get away with when they move further south. Uh, and in terms of recovery, if they have any problems, you know, the South is pretty forgiving for running a bee operation. That's why so many beekeepers are, are down there producing bees. But, so I had my five hives, and I, I picked my five best breeders from Vermont. I take them to Montana, and now I went down to Florida. I was working down there, and just through the power of grafting, you know, I was working as a queen raiser. Um, uh, down there for, for a while on the west side of Florida for a guy with 15,000 hives, then another beekeeper out of New Jersey with 4,000 hives, just raising queens every day for them. But I had my own bees on the side, and that one spring, I guess it was 2006, I mean, 2007 in the spring, uh, I took my five hives, and just by grafting and splitting up uh, uh, these bees, I was able to go to five, five hives, five like double deep hives up to 160 three frame deep hives. So I was taking a regular 10 frame deep box. I put two dividers in it, so I had three, three framers. I made a cheap plywood bottom board, little plastic inner cover so they couldn't get around to get at each other. So it sounds like a, a whole bunch of these, but it was only 50 some deep boxes, but each box had three little baby nukes in that, all raised from the, the stock that I've been working with. And so I was really proud of these bees that I, 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 I uh, propagated, and I knew I wanted to go back up to the Northeast, you know, because it's it seemed very challenging to keep them alive up there in this niche. And I just thought I, I, was, I had faith in this uh, ability to raise queens rapidly, that I could adapt them to, to survive up there with lights and winter and all the, the stressors that bees face. So I made some calls, I put up some signs and things, and suddenly colony collapse disorder hits the newspapers. And the whole country starts bugging out, like literally. And it was suddenly easy to find bee yards. People didn't even want anything. They just wanted to be supportive. And I found 15 bee yards in upstate New York. They're just like that. And I brought them up and I uh, separated these nukes out and a few into each of the yards, right on the dandelion flow. And uh, these bees were super clean. Well, they were these like 
survivor stock, I was calling them at that point, the survivor genetics. They weren't quite honed in to be bulletproof, but uh, they were something I was proud of and I thought had potential. And I had broken the brood cycle just in this queen rearing process. You steal the queen, a mate queen, put her in a cage, uh, use her somewhere else or sell her to another beekeeper. And meanwhile, you drop in a queen cell, about a week goes by before that new queen is uh, about hardy enough to go fly and mate. So every three weeks or so, I would remove the old queen, put in a new queen cell. So every month, these little nymphs were getting a break in the brood cycle. So that slows down the bees' growth, but it also slows down the varroa mite growth. And I realized that this process of breaking the brood cycle was enough to really keep the mites below that killing threshold for a while. As long as I kept doing it, pretty much religiously. <laughs> Every three weeks go by, I was removing the queen, replacing her. And I realized that this is what bees do when they swarm. You know, the old queen leaves and it's almost three weeks that go by before that new queen uh, is mating to uh, uh, replace her. By that time, all the hive is totally broodless. By the time the new queen comes around, all your mites that are usually in the brood, you know, 70, 80% of the mites are always in the cat's brood where the treatments can't get to them. And, and, and so, but if your hive goes broodless during this brood break, as if they're, when they're raising their own queen, all the mites are now phoretic. They're all crawling around in the hive. And bees have a grooming behavior. They have a biting behavior. They will bite the mites off of each other, pick on their legs and things like that. It's almost like the bees know what they're doing, right? <laughs> Over tens of million years, uh, uh, millions of years, I think they really do. So, but of course, if you let your hive swarm and let that full brood break happen, it's like half of your money flying out into the woods from a commercial perspective. But I find that the hives that swarm or get this full brood break are really the healthiest come fall. Of course, dead bees don't make any honey. So it's a whole different kind of approach to using brood breaks rather than like uh, chemical controls. And it's a whole different kind of style that like, you know, I do things pretty differently <laughs> as being queen raiser, not being a, a migratory pollinator anymore. But so I had these 160 nukes that I brought up from the south. I placed them on the dandelion flow and they were healthy uh, from these brew breaks and the genetics that I was doing. And they started to bubble out the size of the boxes and really grow really quickly in the spring honey flow. And I looked around and I didn't have another frame or another box or anything to put these growing hives into. And I was broke at that point. I had burned through all my pollination money. So, I really had no choice but to really stumble on the, the real mission of anarchy apiaries. It's to bring the means of production back to the beekeeper, to make beekeeping a lot simpler, a lot more affordable, a lot more approachable than it has been for the last 170 years. Why that long? Well, let's, we can do a little history lesson. We can go back to 1851. You know, that's the year that Lorenzo Langstroth patented the movable frame hive, which became ubiquitous around the world. And, uh, but before that, you know, beekeepers would just make their own hives. They would get some straw, make a skep like this, or they would hollow out a log and make a bee gum. But they just uh, hammer a couple boards together, make a box hive. They use whatever it was around. But the bees were basically wild. You know, they weren't expected. They would swarm out to the woods. Sometimes they'd swarm back. You lose some. And even back in medieval times, they would, you know, with sulfur and kill half their hives to harvest the honey. And uh, I know that sounds brutal, but to kill off your hives to get the bees, I mean, we still like kill bees, just not intentionally. Uh, <laughs> but you think about uh, you know the hundreds, maybe thousands of years of sulfur in bees. If you're gonna like kill a hive to harvest this honey, you're gonna kill the mean hive. You're gonna <laughs> kill the one that stung you, and over generations, this is probably why our bees are so gentle these days and, and so permissive of us, like, like doing things to them because that's genetic selection. The, well, I mean, I don't intentionally kill my bees anymore, but I can see where how. Uh, how we've come to this point and how beekeepers it used to be a lot more sustainable when we didn't mess with them so much. So you could just like make a hive out of anything for free like that. But what happened when you know the, the industrial revolution came around, everything was getting monopolized. Lorenzo Langstroth patented a, a brilliant discovery of bee space. Uh, and suddenly everyone realized that instead of mashing and straining all their honey, uh, if they take the honeycomb, you have to mash it, strain it. The bees have to make brand new wax every time they want to make more honey. Now you can take that comb out of the hive, spin it in the centrifuge, and give that empty wax comb back to the bees. So all the resources that would have gone to be uh, making more wax, now the bees would uh, uh, put into stored honey. 
and pretty much the, uh, the commercial bee world formed and at that time like overnight because it, it enabled huge honey yields. And your Langstroth hives are still gonna make the most honey by saving that comb year after year, it works great. I still keep a bunch of Langstroth hives and I do spin the combs out of them. But by the late 1800s, a lot of problems were arising from this practice of saving the comb year after year and moving combs from hive to hive. The main problem was American foulbrood, a highly contagious spore-forming bacteria, which is still like a, the major bee disease. It, it can't be killed. It can be irradiated or burned. It's very serious bee diseases. I know a lot of people have gone out of business because they couldn't keep it under wraps like that. Well, beekeeping, um, the bee industry, in light of this like really new uh, disease, decided to put pressure on every state government to ban hives that couldn't be inspected. So these skeps, these straw baskets, the state symbol of Utah, I believe is illegal here. And it's illegal in New York. Most states, if this is a, a not a, a illegal beehive, they have to be inspectable for diseases. They have to be able to remove the brood cones and put it back together. And it was a brilliant move from uh, this budding bee industry, because now rather than all of the wannabe beekeepers building their own hives for free, now they were locked into something that had to be legal. And the, the model they were presented with was the Langstroth hive. Everyone adopted the Langstroth hive, or they uh, were like, not in accordance with the uh, beekeeping laws. Beekeeping went from this common thing that everyone did. Literally, there was a, there were bees at every church, school, every farm had bees. You had dogs, cats, and bees, and some chickens and stuff. Uh, it went from that common practice to what it is today. Even with our recent renaissance in the last decade in beekeeping, it's still like a, an esoteric lost art. We're just a fraction of percent of the population compared to what it was back in the 1800s and so, because everyone now has to buy a Langstroth hive at great cost. We all know like, how expensive these frames and boxes are, and you have to keep replacing them too. So, well, I, I think that we can turn this thing around and you don't have to buy these expensive boxes. And I was thinking, I had all these bees, they were starting to swarm. I could go into $30,000 of debt and buy a Langstroth uh, but buy all the Langstroth boxes I need for my growing nukes. But I really like wanted to look at some alternatives. I wasn't interested in honey or spinning honey. It's like, uh, you know, like extracting is always fun for the first hour, then it becomes a chore. <laughs> but so I just wanted to be able to go in there, rate the brood, have a, an inspectable hive, and just continue this breeding program. You know, rate the brood health and then select uh, the, the next uh, line of mother queens. So I did some reading. Uh, and I read about the Peace Corps in countries like Kenya and Ethiopia in the 70s and 80s. They made something that they called the Kenyan top bar hive. And it was literally just three boards ha hammered together to make a trough and sticks laid on this trough. And the bees would just grow their comb off of these sticks. And it was like super simple. I could go to a sawmill and for about $5, I could get enough lumber you know, uh, to build an inspectable beehive and just shake my bees into it before they swarmed. But I mean, it's five bucks a box. I was bringing them jars of honey and they would give me extra stuff. So but really these days, you show me a dumpster, I can build you a couple of beehives out of the contents <laughs> probably. Well, so I started building these Kenyan top bar hives, uh, these troughs and I realized honey would come later. I just needed something because my bees were swarming into the trees. And um, this is a, a buddy of mine in Vermont, Kirk Webster. He was a real inspiration to me in the early days. Kirk, uh, Kirk is a Russian bee breeder. He brings them up a mountain to breed, uh, have them made in isolation up there. And he's not a top bar guy. He's a Langstroth guy. He really wouldn't be caught dead working a, a top bar hive. This is like a blackmail photo. But I always give a shout out to Kirk because he's one of the only guys that said, I can keep my bees alive without medicating for varroa. And even all my friends said my bees would be dead within two years. But, you know, I haven't treated since 2005. I say I treat them nice, but I'm a, I have a totally different program than like, like uh, selling nukes for a living or stocking honey on shelves or doing migratory pollination. Um, I mean, I do a little bit of all that stuff still, but I'm all about like, uh, breeding, tracking genetics, uh, tough love apiaries, we call it, because I do send them through the ringer and select the best. And that's like, that's what my job is. That's propagating, breeding, uh, tracking families of bees. But Kirk, I give a shout out because he's been at this for a lot longer than I have and has a lot of success wintering them in Vermont and doing no treatments at all. So I started making these top bars and I was selling top bar nukes for a while. I would build like a three, four foot box and sell the bees like that. So I realized I was selling all my combs away. And even when I harvest honey, I would come out with a, just a knife 
cut slabs of honey. I was doing nice cut cone honey, but basically to make jarred honey, my extractor was a bucket and a stick <laughs> through a strainer bag. And I, so that was like taking out a lot of my cones like that as well. And so I stopped selling news because I just didn't have any cones to, to like facilitate growing more bees like that. So instead of selling nukes and selling cones from the top bars, I just start shaking package bees. So I make a real easy funnel out of cardboard and duct tape. It really was fitting in with the, the rest of the aesthetics of my operation. And it was really, I thought, well, this is kind of like a more natural kind of beekeeping because I would have like an overwintered hive and I would see that they were gearing up the swarm starting to make cells. So I would go in and I would just do the queen and I would simulate a swarm, shake a couple pounds of bees out there, let them finish their swarm cells. And I was kind of aiding the decision that they had already made rather than trying to keep them from swarming, uh, squishing their cells. So I was like, really like, doing a lot more working with the bees rather than trying to steer them toward the, uh, my goals. And it, uh, it worked out really well because everything was getting a break in the brood cycle. And at the same time, I was raising new queens, uh, but I was still grafting. So in, in these hives, like, I'm still using queen cups and then doing propagation and like selecting specific breeders that rated the best in terms of like mite counts and gentleness and the ability to overwinter and also make some honey and all the things that we're looking for. Um, so I wondered, like, am I like, a natural beekeeper? Am I a commercial queen producer? Where do I really fit in? And how big do I want to be? Where is the end? Where does this go? Well. This is the Kona Queen operation in Hawaii. I visited here oh, it was probably about 15 years ago. At that time, they were the biggest queen producers in the world. They were raising about 300,000 queens a year. It was fascinating. This is before uh, Varroa reached the island and things like that. It was really cool to see how they organized this operation. This is just some of their cell raisers they were using to, to raise queen cells. And so the way that they did it here is that they had a double nuke system. So there's a queen on this side, this double stack nuke, and there was a queen on this side of that double stack nuke. And then there was a queen excluder that spanned both of those nukes. So that was so the queens couldn't get from one side over to kill each other like that. The queen excluder prevented that. They had a single box on top of, those double, of that double nuke system. And they had a pipe going down each one of these rows. That pipe had offshoots coming out of it. That pipe hooked up to a giant mechanical bellows that blew smoke down the length of this pipe with offshoots underneath each one of these nukes. That smoke would drive the young bees here up through the excluder into that top box. And then once they had enough young bees driven up into that top box, they would slide in a piece of sheet metal and make that top box queenless. Let it sit like that for a couple of hours and then they put their graphs in that way. As soon as those cells were capped, they would get moved to an incubator and they would do the process again. This really blew my mind. It was amazing how, how you produce 300,000 queens in, in a year. It was so cool to see, like working with bee biology, how you could do this. And uh, it's much bigger than I was ever going to get, but it's just so neat to see the innovation that uh, people do with the, based on their bee biology. Well, I was wondering like how I fit in and how I was going to keep my bees alive. You know, I, am a, I, I do identify as a treatment-free beekeeper, but I really like this phrase treatment-free, but not stupid. As I've seen, I've seen like major, as I said, I've seen uh, major losses to varroa mites. I know in a lot of situations, if you're not treating, your, your bees are going to circle the drain really quickly. But uh, I named my business Anarchy Apiaries because anarchy does not make rules for other beekeepers. So we all in our unique situations and we can all still be friends no matter what kind of management you do on your bees. But I try to help people who want to maybe wean off of chemicals and things like that have hardier bees rather than just uh, trying to bounce from the next chemical to chemical because it's all just changing so quickly. The mites are getting stronger, the mites are worse than they've ever been before. They used to, uh, bees, hives used to be able to host a lot of mites and they now get sick and now treating threshold is what one, two mites per roll or something. And, even bees that uh, have less mites than that or seem to have like bad deformed wing and the diseases are getting worse and our bees are, aren't, aren't improving that much. So, but I mean, I take a, a, like a, a three lens approach to look at our, the problems in the bee world, you know, the environment, methodology, and genetics. I think environment is by far the, the most important. You know, you can, whatever you do, no matter what kind of bees that you have, if you're not in a good area, with good nutrition, your bees aren't going to make it. You know, nutrition, just like humans, humans that are well nourished are less, less uh, likely to get sick. You know, same as bees. 
for sure. But methodology, I'm going to spend a, a lot talking about uh, uh, in terms of my queen rearing and how I organize my business these days and genetics. So I'll go into that a little bit of like what has worked for me in terms of microsystems and things like that. So, oh, I wish these were some of my queen cells. Uh, these are really nice looking queen cells. Uh, these are from my buddy, Michael Palmer. He's in Northern Vermont. He's not a treatment free guy, but he's just a very, very good beekeeper. And he's a great teacher. Uh, and anyone should like look at his YouTube stuff. Uh, Michael Palmer's awesome. And he's adapted his bees to survive Vermont winters, 40 below zero, and for honey production. So he's a honey producer. He sells some queens and nukes here, but if a hive in his operation is not making a 200 pound average, he will go in and pinch the queen and replace her. That sounds brutal, right? But that's Mike's operation. He's kind of raised the bar. He's raised the standard of excellence. And that's what he expects from his bees and his breeding program like that. So it's a very, very good beekeeper by like following what he, what his goals are. And he raises really nice bees. These are really nice queen cells. And so I was like doing grafting experiments, learning to, to raise uh, as many cells as this and stuff. I needed uh, uh, places to put them. So it really only takes uh, you know, a couple hundred bees to incubate one of those queen cells and send that young queen out on a mating flight and have her return. And then I can do it again and again every couple of weeks. So I need lots and lots of little tiny hives, mating nukes or baby nukes, we call them. So I started doing really tiny top bars on top of a flower pot, a little six inch terracotta flower pot with little tiny top bars. And they were uh, cute as could be, really. And they worked and they sent out queens mating, but they were really kind of too small. They kept running out of room. I started reading some studies that say a queen should really go three weeks before she's caged. Otherwise she'll never reach her full egg laying potential. If you let her age a little bit before she's caged, she develops her ovarials a little better. She's a longer lived queen. I believe in this. I wanted to have a good quality queen so that I was producing. So about three weeks, these little flower pots were like way too small because they're getting all honey bound and stuff. So I ended up eating them all. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got the bees out of them first. But, uh, <laughs> well, I started trying to find some, like, some simpler beehives that uh, uh, that I could do without a table saw. I'm very grateful to still have all my fingers. You know, I was running these top bars for my top bar highs on a table saw. One year, uh, yeah, I had to cut 5,000 top bars and I was cutting a groove in the top bars. I was gluing in popsicle sticks as this wooden edge that they would start the cones on straight. I did 5,000 top bars one year. I had to eat 20,000 popsicles to have enough popsicle sticks to put in the top bar. This, this is like the things you do to, to help out your bees. So. But, I wanted to simplify it even more, like less table saw, something that, that I could build even faster and less swarmy. One of the problems with horizontal hives is that they get honey mount. You know, you get you have empty space in the back of your top bar, but if that growing cluster hits a wall of honey, they'll get honey bound and they'll swarm even before they fill their whole uh, the whole box like that. So you have to be there to drop empty bars into the brood nest to keep giving those young bees space to work. And stuff, and I just uh, worked up to about oh, over 300 of these top bar hives, and I just couldn't keep up with them. I couldn't keep up with the swarming. I was having trouble keeping some of the combs straight and things, and uh, just trying to get through all these bees. And so I started thinking, like, how can I make it simpler, maybe a more vertical orientation? They wouldn't really move up and down a little bit better, and wouldn't be as swarming. Uh, this is one of the first, um, the, probably the first uh, movable comb hive ever documented uh, in Greece. Well, George Wheeler, uh, check this out, around 1682. And so the kind of these sticks seem a lot easier than, than cutting these top bars on a table saw. So I started adapting, uh, made it into a square box. Uh, these were made out of pallet wood or just one by six, rough cut one by six, true dimension one by six I was getting at the sawmill. And I was cutting these top bars uh, still on the table saw until I discovered this. This is the forefront of beekeeping technology. These are barbecue skewers. You know, you want the nice jumbo ones that are thick, but yeah, these are just skewers that rather than cutting the bars on there and laying them on this groove, I just started laying these sticks on top and the bees started drawing their cones right off of these sticks. And once I, I, I stumbled on this, I was literally just like walking down an aisle in a supermarket. I'm like, oh, I can put bees on that. So, and so this was years ago, and now my whole operation is it's just growing off of barbecue skewers. <laughs> Literally, it's bamboo, sustainable, you know? And so I started making lots and lots of these boxes because now I can build my whole hive without using a table saw at all. I have a jig on a chop saw and I cut these boxes. The only important dimension in here is really the internal is 11 by 11. 
like that. And so I put sticks on the top and they were either six inches deep for these baby newts. And now I let the cones grow even more for the bigger hives. And the top is an 18 by 18 inch tile that'll last forever. And they just sit on milk crates like so. And I even started putting a divider. I have a, a sheet metal divider that slides in to this box like that. So I have a little four cone nuke right here and a four cone nuke right here. And entrance here, entrance here, they sit on a milk crate. And this is just like pennies invested per box here. Another box sits on top of that. So every stand here actually has four of these little tiny mating nudes. It comes out to about 80 cents a box like that. Oh, it's a little more expensive now, but uh, and we sit on these little red wagons as we catch queens and talk about the seat. <laughs> so I talked about breaking the brood cycle a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tapping into the queen's talk, like, but really this is just like one big talk. <laughs> like I, I stick to what I'm good at in my talks, which is just talking about myself, you know? It's like stick to what I know, I guess. But uh, my story is like incorporated into this business and the evolution here. But we'll talk about queens and how it's evolved over the years, uh, right now and then after lunch. But I talked a little bit about breaking the brood cycle, how those mites become phrenic, they get bitten by the worker bees if the worker bees can get to them. So that break in the brood cycle, I started doing a three week cycle on my queens. I will place a white queen cell into the nuke. And three weeks later, I come back. And if that queen is mated, and she made it on time successfully, they will have their own capped brood of that new queen. So I can tell that she's mated well, she's developed her ovarials a little better, and she's ready to cage. And we do the cycle again. So every three weeks, I started having three different mating yards. So every week, I would work a different mating yard. Three weeks go by by the time I get back. And after a couple rounds of breaking that brood cycle, the brood looks like this. It's almost virtually mite free. Not only is it like very low parasites, it's also very well nourished because that break in the brood cycle also swells the worker bees, the young nurse bees, their hypopharyngeal glands, what makes the royal jelly. So if they don't have any larvae to feed for a week, these young nurse bees swell the hypopharyngeal glands. And when that new queen starts laying, this larva is like super fed. It gets an abundance of royal jelly. These are like super bees. They have lots of vitelligenin. Vitelligenin is this protein compound that creates more royal jelly. It basically makes, makes, uh, makes the bees longer lived. Vitelligenin is like the essence of a beehive. If bees are healthy, they have lots of vitelligenin and therefore disease resistant, resistant to everything. So I realized that these are the young bees, the bees that emerge from this, this well-fed brood. These are the bees that I want to feed the next round of queen cells. So I started working on the system of like, I want to bank this brood and put it into next week's cell razor. So I started doing that on rotation. So I made these cell razor boxes that could fit these little tiny baby combs. At this point, I'm all box hives in my whole operation. So we boost a box like this every seven days and put a new graft. So uh, my queen, uh, my, my cell razors like this are always queenless. But every seven days, we put more emerging brood in and a new graft. Every seven days, we go in here and graft again. So, and after a couple rounds of boosting, they start to look like this. This, uh, if you're putting, you know, 40, 50 queen cells in, in a box, you want more young bees that fit that, that can fit in that box. So, but I mean, these seven cell raisers are pretty much like, like would drive the whole operation. I use the same box all, all year. Uh, usually, I pick six different breeders. That I'm doing and I graph from them every week. And that seventh cell raiser is actually for a guest breeder. <laughs> if uh, a friend has a cool queen or if I come across some new genetics I want to try every week and we'll we can try a little set of uh, something new and incorporate it into the gene pool here. But um, it's, it's been very fun uh, like, like establishing a seven day program like so. And really I, I thought after like trying, I mean, I've been raising queens since the beginning, like 19 years now. I've never really done it the same way twice. Uh, all the methods work and stuff, but it's just finding out what works for you and your operation and how much time you want to commit to so like time. Like, like for me, it's like, I want to spend with these, but I realized over the years that I'm not like everyone. <laughs> not every, other people have like maybe different aspects of their life and they don't want to play with bees every day. But uh, after years, I thought that this was the simplest that I could possibly make it, that I know what I'm doing every single day of the year. So on Mondays, we boost those cell raisers, and we either use that capped brood uh, from the previous week's catch, or uh, I also shape package bees sometimes and just give it an instant boost of young bees if the cell raisers need it. Um, and then we graft after those cell raisers are boosted every Monday. And Tuesday, we catch queens. 
and uh, as we're catching queens, we're harvesting brood. So those little baby nukes, those four cone nukes, they have to go another three weeks until we're back to visit them. So they have to be cut back. Say we do 300 nukes a week, you know, say it's a perfect take, say we get 100% mating, 100% mating never happens. There's always some queens that don't make it back. We hope for maybe 80%, often it's over 90%, but some queens, you know, get eaten by a dragonfly, eaten by a purple martin, or they can get struck by lightning, have hit by a plane. It's like, I don't know, who knows what happens out there. But, uh, so they don't all make it back. But say like 100% make it back, we're working 300 nukes a week, we'll get 300 mated queens out of that operation, but we'll also get 300 capped cones of brood out of those mating nukes. And so it's like a brood factory. I'm actually more interested in harvesting the brood from these mating nukes than I am harvesting the queens. Because that brood uh, goes to fix any mating nukes that were misses that the queen didn't make back. First, we, we fix up any uh, nukes that didn't have a mated queen. And then we take some of that brood, we bank it on Tuesdays above a queen excluder for next week's cell raiser boost for next Monday, because we want that brood totally capped when we put it into the cell raiser. If there's like a rogue egg or larva in there, they could raise a rogue cell. And if I don't see that queen cell, you know what will happen? The, 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 the young virgin queen will emerge and destroy all the grafted cells. That's never happened to me before. I always find every single row. So, no, I'm just kidding. That's, that's, there's, there's constant drama <laughs> out there, constant problems. You know, queens are expensive. This is why. You know? But um, we bank it above an excluder. So it's ideally all capped by the time next week's cell raisers get their boost. And then Wednesday, we finish catching that set. 300 nukes usually takes me and a couple other people two days to catch. And then Thursday, we place the ripe cells. Not the ones that were grafted three days prior, but the ones that were grafted the week prior. So that's 10 days. Uh, that's a 10 day cell that we're putting in. And letting these little tiny nukes sit one to two days queenless really uh, uh, is better for cell acceptance. We get, uh, when the honey flows on, things are good, we get over 90% takes by doing this operation. And this has been really fun because every week, I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna do the same thing, but I get to tweak variables. Maybe I get to change something on the cell razor feed, or I get to change a little design aspect of the mating nuke. It, it's really opened up all this uh, experimentation. Because uh, well, believe it or not, I need structure in my life. <laughs> I need like a solid foundation. And it's all very regimented. We're out here rain or shine. But every week I can get, get to try a new breeder, a new uh, genetics, and also have all this experimentation. And also invite people out to see that the, it's taking a lot of the stress away knowing what I'm doing every day. I have come people out and come, come out for four days and see the whole weekly process, come graft, come catch, come bank, brood, and put the cells in. And so I started uh, like inviting friends out who wanted to like, up their queen rearing game and uh, see what I was doing. And so, uh, well, just briefly on some of the genetics, like I said, environment's probably most important. Some of these methods of brood breaks are really what I rely on to keep my lights down like that, but also I rely on genetics as well. So if I, don't, I, I pretty much do brood breaks on my entire operation. I split all my hives into nukes every year, unless they've swarmed, in which case they've already split themselves and done the job for me, which I see is just you know, a sign of their vitality. It doesn't bother me. They've broken the brood cycle and they're good to go for another season. But uh, you know, I tend to put a thousand hives into winter, split them into 2000. And uh, these last couple of years, I've raised four to 5,000 queens a year with this weekly system. That's a lot of <laughs> queens for just a couple of people. And I'm doing some cool genetics. This is one of my inseminated breeders. Uh, she's a BSH breeder. I use a lot of uh, BSH means for real sensitive hygiene. These bees have been bred to uh, have a very acute sense of smell. Like that, the, the worker bees from uh, the, the daughters of a queen like this can smell a pupa that is infested with varroa. And they also have this uh, uncapping behavior. They can not only smell the pupa that's infested, they will uncap and then remove that pupa along with the varroa that's biting it. And so this is a, a trait that was discovered at the USDA Baton Rouge Bee Lab by uh, Jeff Harris, John Harbo, uh, a couple decades ago. And they started uh, using insemination to like uh, augment this trait. And at first these bees were very kind of nasty. They didn't have good temperament and some of them were cannibalizing 90% of their brood. They would just uncap all the brood, whether they had varroa or not. And they were really problematic for a couple of years, but recently in the last five, 10 years or so, a lot of other bee breeders have 
taken up this ferrose sensitive hygiene trait and it made a lot of improvements. And it's, for me, it's uh, one of the most inheritable traits that I found for mite resistance. Uh, so this is like a carnial in line that has uh, the ferrose sensitive hygiene. They're working on now an Italian line that's fit for pollination. Uh, they call it the pole line. It's a very nice, gentle Italian bee with a big clusters suitable for almonds. And they ran them through several almond pollinator operations and selected them back from that, that uh, bees that like, ideally will not need varroa treatments at all like that. The broody Italian VSH is not quite there yet. It's not quite bulletproof. It's not quite like a queen that you're going to drop into your hive and it's going to solve all your varroa problems, but it's getting there. It's a, a but this is also just one mechanism. This, and really we're breeding bees that cannibalize their own young. I think it'd be like a controversial <laughs> or something, but it's just one mechanism that we find that is highly inheritable. I've tried Russian bees and wild type bees and their gene pool is so diverse that they kind of go every which way <laughs> like that. But the bro sense of hygiene, I'd recommend if you're looking to increase mite resistance, uh, you can bring some of these queens into your operation and then just see, see how they do for you, you know? But, so we try um, doing, uh, yeah, yeah like every week we try some new genetics and things like that. I still have like uh, a bunch of different breeders in there, but uh, every week we try to have as many queen cells as possible and we call out uh, the smallest ones that don't ever make it to the mating nukes. I brought one of my little tiny grafting frames either. So you can feel free to come and check this on out. We're big on cuteness <laughs> in the operation here. So everything that else fits these little tiny box hives like that and everything's like homemade and until you can buy these at Man Lake, uh, you're gonna have to make them yourself. <laughs> but feel free to check this stuff out that I brought. And you know, every week I go to the post office and uh, with like a big stack of buzzing envelopes and the postal employees, they think it's weird. I think it's weird, but I bring them a jar of honey and they always are uh, like happy to see me and the, the queens tend to get there on time, <laughs> you know? But so that's kind of what we do on a weekly cycle every week. Um, and we're just trying to have really good quality queens. Every queen raiser in the world wants to have the best queens. So we try every week to like see how many cells we can get, how big they can be, how big the pupa can be. This would have been a really good queen if I hadn't opened up the cell like that. But not all of these queen cells make the cut. So I, I always have like a couple of small kind of runty cells that I never place into the mating nukes, and I end up like making them into chocolate chip cookies. Like, like that. I, I really don't I see like the purple eyes. And so people get really freaked out by this. Well, some people have asked me for the recipe and stuff, but I, I, I haven't really found a lot of people to eat these with me. <laughs> but it's something to do. This is our first stage of quality control in queen rearing. Well, all right, this, this is one of my mating yards down in Florida. There's probably about 500 nukes here. This is the aerial view. In every stand you see, you're looking at the tiles. So every stand is actually four nukes. So there's hundreds here. And so I like even going further down the rabbit hole, I, I sort of dedicate each one of these little clusters to a different family line. And so the center hive would be the brood bank. It would get brood from that family line to that brood bank. And every cell raiser has its dedicated family. So I'm trying to keeping always the same genetics of who gets the cells and things like that. Did it make a difference? No, <laughs> I don't think so. When you start talking about epigenetics and like you know, genomics and things like that, I would hope it would get uh, you know, better cell acceptance, better care of the queen before she goes to mate and things like that. But you know, it's really when the honey flows on, we do really well, no matter like what we're doing uh, to these nukes. So, but um, so like I said, I started opening up the apiary to, to friends, uh, people who you know, had some bee experience, maybe some grafting experience, who, people with a hundred hives or more who wanted to up their queen rearing game, go back and uh, uh, see if they can develop their own local stock like that. This is my buddy, Aaron Jennings from Jennings Apiaries in Louisiana. And he came out for the whole four day uh, weekly queen rearing program. This is him grafting a bit and he loved it. We had a blast, you know, so it's like fun playing with these little mating nukes, you know, I just wear shorts and sandals. Nobody ever wears a veil. They're such tiny little clusters that uh, they don't really sting ever. So. After four days, Aaron just thought it was so awesome. And he, but he looked at me and said, this is way too much work. I'm just going to buy queens from you. I'm like, oh, that, that's not the idea. Like, I'm really trying to, you know, I, I, I've been selling thousands of queens, but really I just have more people doing this kind of work, adapting their local stock in their own areas. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I, I started thinking what he said. It's like, yeah, this is too much work. Not everyone's crazy. 
<laughs> so, um, so yeah, and everyone's on the like the, the beekeeping lunatic fringe like that, you know, trying these things all the time. So yeah, so I started thinking like, how do we make this simpler, and so more people can do it without having two thousand mating nukes and all the grafting skills and things. So and there are several beekeepers that only sell queen cells like that. They don't need the 2,000 mating nukes or things like that. One of them uh, is my uh, friends in Florida, the Mixes. Uh, Matt mentioned the Mixes yesterday. He buys some queen cells from them and the Mixes actually ship the right queen cells in the mail. They gave them a good pound or two of cover bees to incubate them on the last day and you pick them up at the UPS hub and they start emerging that day. So you have your splits ready to go, just drop a queen cell in. And these queen cells are $5 each as opposed to the $35 I sell a queen for. And they have a whole list of different genetics, different breeders that they have. I can get Ontario Buckfast. I can get Carniolan Varroa Sensitive Hygiene. I can get Blackshaw Italians. I can get all kinds of uh, Purdue Mite Biters. They have all these breeders and it's just so cool to try this different stock and uh, get, you know, it should, be, should be 200 cells at a time. And it's like, this is a really cool business model and more people are now shipping queen cells. We have more parameters of uh, how it's done, how to keep them warm enough. And I think this is a really cool way when people want to like breed bees, work on genetics and get their stock out there rather than having thousands of mating nukes and just selling mated queens. Yeah. Isn't there a time period between the cell movement affects your wheat growth? There is, there is. Um, so right when the cell is capped is when they are most fragile. So the question was, uh, is there a time when the uh, cells are really fragile and they can be damaged like that? And yes, there is. It's, uh, they're capped about four and a half to five days after the graft. Uh, and that's when they're most fragile. Right? That, that after their fifth instar, the, the last molt of the larva when it's turning into a pupa and raising the cocoon. If it's shook at that time, the, that larva can fall out of the royal jelly and it can uh, get damaged like that. So that's that time that you don't want to inspect your graft about five days after you've grafted. But the, the mixes have uh, tried this for 20 years at this point, and they know that they ship at the last minute. So that right before the cells are starting to emerge, about nine days, 10 days after, actually they ship at 10 days after their graft. So they do start to emerge when they, uh, they arrive to the customer. And also my friends uh, at uh, Oregon State University have just published a queen cell shipping guide that's free. You, you can find it online, just look at a queen cell shipping guide at OSU. Uh, and it's really cool if you want to get into this. They, they did a bunch of trials at different ages, and they actually did trials of dropping the, the box of cells on the ground, which, I mean, UPS, who knows what's going on there. But they find that, yeah, at that last minute before the cells emerge, even drop, the, you'll get most of them to survive, to survive emerging in your, your mating nukes. And uh, when I've gotten cells shipped to me, it tends to be over 80% success. And so way more financially viable than buying that many mated queens as well. And plus your, your hives, your splits, you make will get a, a slightly longer brood, brood break, a locally mated queen. So you're not totally shifting the genetics, but you can try some new, new stuff. Uh, it's, it's a pretty cool process. And the mixes here, they're just experts. They raise about 80,000 queen cells a year. They ship most of them across the country like that. Uh, they're, they're really good at it. I've learned a lot from them. But how we make this even simpler, you know? Say you got grafting skills and you wanna get the genetics out there. Well, this is a two day old queen cell. Where am I at for time here? They were uh, big, about five more minutes. Yeah, sure. Okay, how to make it even simpler? Well, this is a two day queen cell. It was grafted two days ago, 48 hours. So you can actually take a queen cell that you grafted, you can take it out of your cell razor and put it into a split. And the split will actually accept this larva it hasn't pupated yet. There's a, a, a larva floating in this royal jelly. And this is actually the hardiest stage of the queen's life cycle when it's still a larva. And you can ship these actually with no cover bees. You actually want the temperature to cool down. It slows down that lar larva's metabolism. Uh, the key is just to, to keep them damp. Don't let them dry out. Oh, probably. Um, we haven't experimented that much with the shipping yet, but I, I'd say you don't want them to freeze, but uh, probably like 50 degrees or maybe even less. So that's like a next stage of uh, some of the research we want to do on these. It's pretty neat because 
You don't need any cover bees in the shipping. We would just wrap them in some of the damp paper towels. You don't even have to write live bees on the envelope. <laughs> it's kind of wild like that. So uh, my buddies and I, um, we are all interested in rearing queens and uh, exchanging genetics. And uh, some of my friends at May Keep Bees LLC uh, said, well, we want to write some grants and uh, get work on a, a queen breeders collective a cooperative that we can do. Uh, what, what, what do we need? What are we gonna pitch for a grant to get some funding as a queen breeders alliance like that? And well, my first thought is like, we need a party. We need a big party for, for us queen raisers. Uh, just like a meeting of the minds, a round table and sharing of methods. It's, it's so important for a camaraderie as beekeepers because we're such a loners <laughs> out here. So we need a gathering, but like no grant is gonna fund just a big party. But uh, we also need a genetic exchange. Like that, that seems key to like sort of mite resistance or like whatever we're breeding for to make better bees, you know, stronger bees all, all the time. So genetic exchange, this is one of the, the things that would make it easier rather than shipping mated queens or even ripe queen cells. It's easy to swap around genetics, just throwing in, in, in an envelope like this. So we actually got a grant to research these 48 hour queen cells and look at their quality like that. And uh, it turns out, if you even if you remove this queen cell from any bees for like one to two days and just like we would just sit them on the counter or drive around with them, then we put them into a queenless split. They are viable, they're accepted, and we started sending some of them for a spermatheca analysis at, at, at the um, North Carolina State University Bee Lab. And their quality was just as good as our grafted cells, like that. And so, this is pretty neat stuff, like that. It's like novel methods. It does slow down your nukes, definitely. It's a much longer brood break and things like that. And well, how do we get it even simpler? You know, it's like go beyond grafting. Grafting, like I said, is all about the numbers. You graft 40 or 50 cells per box, but it takes some skill, skill, it takes some practice. I really don't recommend the paperclip method <laughs> at all. But there are ways to, to raise a bunch of queen cells without grafting, such as this one, the Miller method. You can cut some, some zigzags into your uh, comb of eggs and larvae. They'll raise, tend to raise the cells on the edges here, and uh, you can cut out as like if, uh, because of the diagonal edges, you can cut this one out, cut that one out. These two are probably stuck together, so you'll have to put them in as a clump. But because of the edges, you can tend to get all the cells. I found that doing this, the queens weren't all that good. They'll raise several of them, sure, but maybe only half or less will be really good quality. Some of them will be very small queens and stuff. So I don't really do this method or teach it anymore, but it is a way to get extra queen cells per box. But I just started letting them raise their own and fight it out. Because this is like a natural cycle of a, a hive when left to its own devices. They'll raise several queen cells. The first one to emerge is gonna like, like take out all of her sisters. And it's kind of like how uh, the bees do some of their own quality control. So sort of making lots of tiny queenless splits, letting them fight it out and just testing the results. We were able to get another grant to look at these walkaway splits, or these emergency queens. So sort of like no grafting methods, but how can we raise the most bees, uh, most queens without grafting, something that anyone can do, even with just one hive in their backyard. And so um, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna go into all this data from this grant stuff that I just did, but I'm gonna stop here. We'll, we'll hit, pick this back up at, uh, after lunch. But I will say that I see these simpler methods as really what's gonna be our viable beekeeping future. You know, I'm on 2000 little baby hives right now, but my long-term goal is to work down to five hives. I want, I want five hives, I want a fishing pole and a hammock and a network of us sustainable beekeepers who know how to raise our own queens, adapt them to our means, even if we're doing pollination or whatever you do, raising your own queens is gonna improve your, your operations so much. And it doesn't have to be complicated like grafting, you don't need thousands of hives, even you can just do it with one hive and I'll go into some of the methods that we discovered from some of this research we've done after lunch. So um, I'll probably take questions I get uh, yeah, this afternoon, I think. Yeah, or or fine, mm -hmm. now we're here during lunch. Uh, we got lunch ready. Uh, we've got pizza out here in the, on the tables. Um, there are a couple of gluten-free pizzas that are in the white boxes on the back side. I don't know which direction I'm at right now. So if you're gluten-free, and there's a couple of pizzas that are for you guys, but um, let's come back in about an hour and get started again. <laughs> Sorry.
So where are you staying in Providence? Uh, New York. Oh, uh, Hudson Valley, like oh, Catskills. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's nice up there. <laughs> so you guys call that upstate up from up near uh, Syracuse. So yeah, yeah, that, that's the true upstate. I bet he's up in the Adirondacks and like Pots, 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 Pots